Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this special event with Oxford Martin School at the Oxford Union, the world's most famous debating society. The Union was founded in 1823 as a forum for discussion and debate, and our debates have had national and international impact since our foundation. As you may well know, the Union is a world-renowned venue for hosting high-profile speakers. Over the years, we've been fortunate enough to have the Dalai Lama, Her Majesty the Queen, Mother Teresa, President Reagan, President Nixon, President Carter, and Michael Jackson, and numerous <laughs> other significant figures. Today, our debate format is slightly modified from our traditional Oxford Union debating style. At the start, each speaker will first deliver their eight-minute speeches, and then there will be a 20-minute cross-examination session among our speakers. After the cross-examination part of our debate, we will open the, uh, open the floor for questions from the audience. Finally, each speaker will get to make a short concluding remark at the end. As ever, tonight you will be voting with your feet so please remember that at the end of the debate, you decide the outcome of this debate by walking out of the chamber through one of the doors there. Walk through, walk through I's side if you're in favor of the motion, walk through no side if you're against the motion. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, without a further ado, I will introduce the motion put before the House this evening. This House believes that the current growth crisis is a result of technological stagnation in a risk of our society. And I, I now invite Professor Ian Golden, director of the Oxford Martin School, who will introduce the speakers and chair the ensuing debate. Thank you very much, President uh, John Lee. Uh, warm welcome to all of you uh, on behalf of the Oxford Martin School, and a particular warm welcome to our astounding speakers uh, and also to Jim and Lillian Martin, who were the inspiration and vision behind the Oxford Martin School. What we aim to do is to bring great minds together to think about the toughest challenges of the 21st century. We aren't innovation in ourselves, but we seek to sponsor innovation. We seek to find innovation and to accelerate its transmission into solutions. And there can be no better group of people than those that we have tonight to help us think this through what drives innovation, and how, we may accelerate, how may we accelerate it. To have one of these speakers would be a privilege. To have all four of them is extremely fortunate. We will have first proposing the motion, Gary Kasparov. Gary was born in Azerbaijan in the former Soviet Union. He rose to become the youngest world chess champion in history in 1985 at the age of 22. Uh, and his peak rating is still the highest of all time. Many regard him still as the greatest chess player of all time. Although beaten by the computer Deep Blue in 1997, in 2003, he drew, he drew a match with Junior Blue. Now, Junior Blue calculates three million positions per second. So that is Gary's mind. <laughs> After 20 years as the world's top-ranked player, uh, Gary retired from chess in 2005 and is using his formidable intellect uh, in new and even more challenging ways, which is the reform of the politics of the Soviet Union as the leader of the United Civil Civic Front Party, which is a key part of the other Russia coalition. He's a potent voice for democracy and civil rights, and as you saw in the Pussy Riot protest, where I was very worried that we'd lost our speaker into the prisons, um, he stands up for justice and civil rights. He started the Kasparov Chess Foundation, which promotes the teaching of chess and thinking in schools. He's created this in over 3,500 schools, including those now in Europe and South Africa. He's done a number of books, and in fact, this event owes much to my discussions with Gary. It was our private discussions around what drives innovation and his determination that we should have this out in public uh, that led to this event. I was too scared to match him, so I found others that I think would be better challenges. The second proposer is Peter Thiel. As you know, Peter is the brain and the person behind a number of the key innovations which are in our pockets every day. He was the co-founder in 1998 of PayPal and its CEO at a most extraordinary time, and that coterie of people that he brought around him 
remain people that he sports and sponsors to the day. After selling PayPal, he founded a global macro fund, Clarion. He then founded Palantir Technologies and keeps on being an angel investor for many. He was the first outside investor in Facebook and still has a sizable part of that and is on the board. He co-founds and managed uh, the Founders Fund. And throughout Silicon Valley, when you speak to people about who is driving things, his name always comes up. We have Elon Musk next Wednesday speaking in the Sheldonian for the Oxford Martin School. But SpaceX, LinkedIn, uh, run by Reid Hoffman, who's on our advisory council, Yelp, Causes, Robotics, Spotify, all of them say, you've got to speak to Peter. He is the philosopher, the visionary, and much, in many cases, the funder behind much of what happens. This derives in no small part from his philosophy degree from Stanford, and now in public debates, you will see this combination of business knowledge and deep philosophical understanding. First for the opposition is Mark Shuttleworth, who graduated from the University of Cape Town with a degree in finance and information, founded Thwaites, and very quickly developed encryption technologies and cryptography, which became the basis for very sign when you put your your credit cards into a machine and they work out whether it's you and legitimate. That's Mark's invention behind that from those times. After doing that, he created many new enterprises and more than that, was determined to bring science and education uh, to the masses in Africa. He created something called Hip to be Square, a clothing design series, watches and all sorts of things, and also promoted education in, in um, many, many schools. In April 2002, he became a private cosmonaut. Uh, I think he's the only one here that's been in space, going up to Soyuz in the International Space Station. He then toured this and convinced people in many places that they needed to do more about investing in different areas of maths and science. He created Ubuntu, which is, as you know, an incredible open source form of software used on desktops and service, and that is still where he paces most of his activities through his company, A Chemical. Mark, it's fantastic as a scientist and inventor that you are here as well tonight. And secondly, for the opposition, we have Professor Ken Rogoff, who, like me, is an economist. He's the Thomas Cabot Professor of Public Policy and Economics at Harvard University. He was the Chief Economist and Director of Research at the International Monetary Fund. His treatise on international macroeconomics is a standard text, which many have read in over 50 countries. His recent book with Carmen Reinhardt, This Time is Different, is the most cited text on the financial crisis and debt. And across all of this, he's the person, when you ask people, uh, who do you speak to about the debt crisis? It's always Ken's name that comes up. Last year, he won the Deutsche Bank Prize for Financial Economics. He's on the Advisory Council of Fed Reserve. He holds a life title of International Grandmaster of Chess, and I guess that's how he knows Gary. Um, so I thought he would be a much fitting match than anyone else I knew. We are privileged to have this formidable set of opponents and contesters for the debate, and I'd like to invite Gary to start by proposing the motion, which is that this House believes that the current growth crisis is a result of technological stagnation in a risk-averse society. Gary, you have the floor. Yes, um, good evening, and thank you very much for this uh, invitation for the Oxford Union. Uh, just reminded me when you mentioned Deep Blue that uh, I spoke here 15 years ago, almost exactly on the day, November 7, that was fresh after Deep Blue match, and it was quite a lively discussion. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be here, and uh, thanks to Professor Golden for um, giving us an opportunity to bring uh, such important uh, uh, idea and issue to probably the most prestigious venue for the debates in the English-speaking world. Um, when we talk about uh, great inventions that shaped and formed our modern world, I think we can, we, we, we can reach a consensus. We talk about uh, electricity, internal combustion, uh, um, uh, airplanes, satellites, uh, vaccinations, antibiotics, um, then followed by uh, integrated circuit and ever small descendants, uh, computers, uh, uh, internet, uh, cell phones, they all merged uh, 
in uh, smartphones that could be found probably in, in everyone's pocket here. Um, and it seems that it's a uh, it's never-ending story. So for many, I believe, you know, our proposition sounds like a blasphemy. We're trying to, to attack a common sense, do we? Um, but when we start analyzing the nature of what we call inventions, uh, innovations, uh, we just recognize that this nature has changed, quite dramatically changed. For instance, we can look at the, at the Time magazine. If we take it as a source of um, citing the best and most important inventions, 2008, it's iPhone, 2010, iPad. <laughs> and 2009, by the way, in the middle, it's Aris Rocket, which has been basically, you know, worked on the design of Werner von Braun. And I, um, I believe that it, it, it's, it, it should give us, you know, a good reason to actually look carefully at, 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 at the nature of, of uh, um, these, uh, of these uh, innovations. Uh, we still use Edison's electric bulb. Uh, we still use internal combustion engine. By the way, knowing that it's poisoning us. We're burning more coal in the 21st century than in the 19th century. Just as a statistics. Again, recognizing all, uh, 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 all the consequences. Um, and uh, um, we are probably um, victims of these uh, uh, dangerous uh, fairy tale. It's a sort of propaganda that, you know, uh, every new iPhone, iPad, whatever, a small gadget, you know, it's, it's a really big invention. So iPhone 5. But can we compare this impact with Apollo 5? I don't, I don't, I, I don't think so. Um, and uh, why, why we are why we're stuck with, with these incremental inventions. Uh, many believe that, you know, that's, that's good enough. We can just move forward by, by adding a little bit here, a little bit there, and we'll just, you know, we'll come up with, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, something phenomenal, and it will be um, you know, a great future. And we believe that, you know, things that are happening in the last 20, 30 years, they're real inventions. But look at the origin of these inventions. People say mobile phones, the first call made in 1973. Internet. But the technological foundation was developed by the scientists from Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, uh, in 1962 and 1963. The theoretical work by Le Professor Kleinrock was uh, written in 1962 about packet switching. Uh, and analyzing every element, we'll just find out that it has an origin in 50s, 60s, or 70s. Genomics was called the next big thing in the 70s. And we are stalled in such major areas of human progress, like life expectancy, uh, energy production, and speed of travel. We are traveling slower than 40 years ago because we have decommissioned Concorde in uh, 2003, in the year 2003. Uh, no, planes, of course, are getting more comfortable, I have to confess. You know, we live in the air, and it's, it's better seats, fuel efficiency, but we are traveling uh, slower. And I think that all these problems, they are connected very much to the psychology of, of our society. We are growing uh, um, complacent. We live in the risk-averse society, and we believe that we can achieve whatever we want by um, avoiding risk. Avoiding risk is a top priority for, uh, for, any, for any business venture today. Uh, and uh, uh, I uh, think that if, if Main Street demands 10% return by avoiding any risk, the Wall Street will come up with, with instruments. So, and uh, it's, it ends up with Benny Madoff. Um, and uh, uh, when we look at the set of current problems, and we understand that we have political problems, we have social problems, we have economic problems, and uh, we, those who are supporting this proposition, believe that it's a result of this technological slowdown. Because we are not taking risk, we are not coming up with new industries. We are stuck with all that was invented before, and we believe we can live on this forever but we cannot. Uh, in America, that was a home for most of the, of the innovative ideas for quite a long time. Uh, 40 years ago, the public uh, uh, conscience was, was moved, was, the attention was shifted to the social issues. A lot was achieved, segregation, uh, uh, emancipation. So uh, the great society proclaimed uh, um, by Lyndon Johnson, uh, but at what cost? Uh, the innovation was slowing down because we wanted to avoid risk. We wanted to uh, utilize all the great inventions uh, and, the, and the monetary return to uh, fix the social issues. 
And at one point, we just recognized that we didn't have enough, enough money to pay for all these uh, great ideas. And what we did, we didn't want to take risk. Because innovation is risk. Uh, you know, it's, it's after, uh, after all, we have to recognize that before it gets better, it gets worse. Because any new industry first will scratch jobs. And before it creates, it creates new jobs. And instead of space engineers, we have been creating financial engineers. Instead of the great scientists, we, we have more lawyers. I mean, no offense. Then. <laughs> we need all of them, but you know, we, we have to concentrate on what makes the, makes, uh, the, uh, uh, the real difference. And of course, politicians today, they don't want to touch these problems. They don't talk about, about real issues. So the last campaign in the United States could be best described by Winston Churchill, who said there are too many uh, public speeches and too little private thinking. And that's the problem. We have to look at the, at, at the nature of, of, of every element of the crisis. And then we recognize that it's inside of us. It's very much psychological. Unless we don't want to recognize that the risk, as Adam Smith proved well, you know, quite a long time ago, the risk is, is an indispensable part of success in a capitalist society. We'll be repeating the same, uh, uh, mm, the same vicious circle. And uh, we believe that it's time to reconsider and time to move forward, to take risks, uh, and to build a better and brighter future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. The first speaker against the motion, Mark Shuttleworth. Well, su <clears throat> suspension of disbelief is clearly the theme for the evening because to carry the motion tonight, uh, you have to believe not one, but in fact, three delightfully preposterous ideas. Uh, the first is that as a species, as a culture, we have suddenly become, in the last 30 years, risk averse. The, the second, which is preposterous because we as a species have always been risk averse. The second, is that that risk averseness is at the heart of a terrible slowdown in technological progress. And the third is that the slowdown in technological progress is what's at the heart of this financial crisis. All three are flawed. Um, so let's start with risk averseness. Uh, our proponents point the finger at government and celebrate a golden age of investment in the 1950s and 60s when governments underwrote programs that gave us manned space flight and the internet. Well, Governments have always been deeply risk averse, and those programs were in fact built not of Star Trek optimism to boldly go where no man had gone before. They were built out of fear. And I know because I stood on the platform that launched Sputnik and Gagarin and then climbed up a, a, a rocket that was at the time a nuclear missile. And that nuclear missile was supposed to deliver the strike that the internet was supposed to survive. So governments have always been risk averse. There is no change in the behavior of governments. Most of us, with the possible ex exception of Mr. Kasparov, live in democracies. And, <laughs> and while it's easy to point the finger at government, we appoint government. Governments have always essentially responded principally to our fears, and that has not changed. What's, what has changed is that our fears are no longer cartoon caricatures of um, of ideological conflict where we face imminent destruction. The, the, the challenges of today come from our own behavior, our own consumption, and it's much harder to get a crisp, clean government mandate for investment when in fact it is us that needs to change our consumption ways to face the real threats um, that we address today. Our proponents um, point the finger at companies and saying that companies have suddenly become risk averse, that companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft sit on piles of cash. That's true. But before them, AT&T and the robber barons and Alexander Bell, the great inventor, all sat on piles of cash. Companies are not innovators. Individuals are innovators. And that's the real point, that if we want to drive technological change, we have to celebrate what is in fact a deeply unpopular and difficult thing to do. To be an entrepreneur, to be an inventor, to be an explorer, you actually have to be a little crazy. You have to be a bit weird. You have to be a nerd or a geek 
or a wacko or a radical. Those are not majority positions. They have never been majority positions. And so what we're seeing today is business as usual. It is easy to look at the headlines, to read pocket histories of the 1950s and 60s, the triumphs and the disasters, and to say, well, that was a time of clarity. Uh, today, the headlines, of course, are stuffed with uh, K. Stu and R. Pats uh, and celebrity nonsense. Um, but at the time, history was, was crowded with celebrity nonsense as well, and the short-term issues of the day dominated the headlines as much as they do today, and inventions still happened. After the crisis, after the collapse of the internet in, in, in 2000, um, it took a long time for people to realize that it wasn't the internet that collapsed, and it wasn't entrepreneurship, and it wasn't science, and it wasn't discovery. Those, all, those things all kept going and will continue to flourish. It was, in fact, just um, the herd mentality of human investment. Bubble and bust are human greed and human the, the, the diff are, are, are consequences of the human inability to deal with decision-making in the face of uncertainty. Those things haven't changed either. Today is, in fact, an extraordinary time to be a scientist, to be a researcher, to be a discoverer, to be an explorer, to be an academic. The possibilities for collaboration, for, um, uh, for the tools for research, and the, and the money to underwrite those research have never been more easily accessible um, across the full spectrum of research and entrepreneurship. So, so if ever there was a time when it was possible to go out as one of those weirdos, wackos, radicals, investors, um, it is today. And I fully believe that despite the, 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 the doom and gloom of the headlines, that there are inventions being made today that will define the, ear, you know, the next decade in the same way that the internet um, and space flight defined what came from the 50s and 60s. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the second speaker for the motion, Peter Thiel. Thank you very much. Well, I think that... But I have a lot to say. Certainly, uh, I think there's a lot that has changed. Uh, and let me start by just uh, not, not giving you the rhetoric, just uh, some numbers. Uh, take 40-year increments, 1932 to 1972, um, mean wages in the uh, United States went up 350% after inflation. You made four and a half times as much money in 72 as you were making in 1932. 1972 to 2012, it went up 22%. Um, if we exclude the rich people who got richer and just look at median wages, they went up 0% in those 40 years. Uh, and, so, uh, and so if you say that progress has uh, been driven by technology in, in the advanced nations of the world, in the West, um, this seems to me to be the strongest prima facie case one could make, that uh, something has changed in a very, very radical way. Um, Mark's uh, uh, talk here was an incredible sort of uh, blast from the past. People, um, most people in the Western world do not share his optimism. Uh, something like 75 to 80 percent of, uh, of people believe that the next generation will be less well off than the current generation. An incredible change uh, from the way people thought about the future in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and we are now well, well ahead of the Carter Malays of 1979 when that number peaked at 50%. We're now up to 75 to 80%. Uh, and I agree that there has been a lot of innovation in different areas, but we need to acknowledge that not all innovations are created equal. And so if you, you know, send a photo of a kitten on an iPhone to someone, or if you uh, look at a video of the Jetsons while you're riding a subway that was built in the 19th century, or any of these sorts of things, it probably is not quite as much as some other things that we could imagine, and, and, uh, and these things don't quite add up. If you had to sort of give a schematic of what's happened the last 40 years, we had progress in computers um, and massive uh, lack of progress, in fact, retrogression in energy. Computers are moving faster. On the other hand, um, oil prices, energy prices are way above 
the 73 period. Uh, and I think that, that the oil shock of 73 represented a technological failure that we have not yet overcome. Um, oil prices were at $3 a barrel. After inflation, that's $20 today. As of now, they're at $107. They have quintupled. And if technology means doing more for less, uh, the energy story has been one of uh, re regression where there has been not enough innovation to offset the uh, gradual depletion of resources. And when you combine these two elements, um, it's like we've been living, we've been running the uh, Red Queen's race in Alice in Wonderland where people have had to run faster and faster just in order to stay in the same place. Now I think that, uh, I think that um, the, uh, one can certainly both, the, uh, there's sort of a financial way to think about the current crisis of the West and there's a technological way to think of it. And there are certainly points of convergence. Um, credit and technology both make claims on the future. Um, and a credit crisis happens when the future is not as good as expected. I will pay you a dollar on Tuesday for a hamburger today. If you end up not making a dollar on Tuesday, or if you don't earn higher wages and you default on your housing mortgage, um, the future did not turn out as well as people expected it to in the past. And the same is true of technology. A technological crisis happens when this technological tailwind no longer is powering our civilization and the implicit expectations of progress abate. And, uh, and when people continue to have the great expectations that uh, Mark has been telling them, has been telling them, you have great expectations, that's when these bubbles happen with redoubled force. And there has been this very strange phenomenon where we've had one bubble after another, after another, after another. Japan in the 80s, uh, tech in the 90s, housing, finance, all sorts of other things in the last decade, and I believe now probably a government bubble in the uh, 2010s. Um, I think there were only two in all of history that compared. There was the South Sea bubble in 1720 and uh, the Wall Street one in the 1920s. Um, so you had two versus four or five in 30 years. And I think that's something that's very different this time, this proliferation of extraordinary bubbles that are driven by people who still have this um, utopian view of the future, but uh, where the reality is not catching up. And that's when it's very dangerous to take on debt and credit when it's not being powered by these sorts of, these sorts of tailwinds. Uh, I think that when the policymakers look at the 1930s as a prism and say, we need to print money or, um, or do something like that to avoid the fate of the 1930s, they are in many ways fighting the last war. There were mistakes made in the 30s. The 30s was primarily a financial crisis. And, uh, and people should have printed money more aggressively. And, and when FDR started doing that in 1933, um, you did get a very robust recovery. Um, but the, you know, the opposition to FDR was always nervous about was there going to be inflation. And there wasn't very much because there was a lot of technological progress in the 30s. You had the development of the commercial aviation industry. You had the development of secondary oil industry. You had uh, the development of the movie industry. Uh, massive industries were developed. By uh, 39, output in the US was way above the 29 high. And in that sort of a world, you could print money and you'd have no inflation. If you now apply these lessons of the 30s to today, um, you end up with something uh, where you have this Hobson's choice of either uh, austerity or inflation, and in some measure we're getting some of each in all these different countries. When you look at, uh, at Europe, it's, it's, uh, it's massive austerity, Britain and the US, it's some austerity and uh, some inflation. And I think sort of the, the tell that something is a little bit off is that even though we have a very anemic recovery, the energy prices are already back at the 2007-2008 highs. Um, in, as measured in euros, oil broke the 2008 highs in March of 2012. Um, food prices, cotton, uh, sorry, wheat, soybeans, um, corn, at this point are at record all-time highs. There's been no innovation on the green revolution in agriculture. That's another major area of technological failure. And, uh, and so as you print money, you end up with inflation in all the wrong places. We need whole new concepts to describe it. I think we're in a world of retroflation. You have bad inflation in commodities and bad deflation in wages, leading to a massive decline in real wages. And as long as the policymakers are focused on this financial prism, and it's a question of how much do we tinker with the money supply or with the banking regulations or things like that, um, you do not even have a chance to, uh, to find an escape from this. Uh, we are both somewhat more uh, pessimistic than the conventional wisdom because we think there has been this 40 years 
that we've been lost in the wilderness where there's been stagnation for 40 years, but we're also more optimistic. We do not need to make this Hobson's choice between austerity and inflation. Uh, we can start to innovate. We can start to do what technology does, which is doing more with less. That's the definition of technology. It's not uh, more with more or less with less, the inflationary or the uh, austerity choices. And I think, uh, I think we need to um, open up our minds to consider a somewhat broader prism and find a way to go back to the future. Thank you very much. I'll just introduce you. The second speaker in the opposition, Kenneth Rogoff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. It's a great pleasure, a great honor uh, to speak here at the Oxford Martin uh, debate. Uh, the incredibly illustrious people before the Queen. Did you let her lose, by the way? I, I don't know. Michael Jackson? The, uh, I, how did you rig that? Um, and of course, also, I'm speaking with uh, three real stars uh, also in, in this debate. I, I have to say, Gary, uh, two of them are billionaires. And had you been successful in your campaign for presidency of Russia, who knows? You might be too. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I want to start out narrowly with the issue of what, if, what is happening right now. Is this secular because of uh, technological slowdown, technological decline, or is it because of a financial crisis? And uh, that's certainly, uh, Gary gave, and, and Peter both gave much broader visions. But let me just start with that. I think we should just dismiss that out of hand. I mean, this 10 or 20 year period, that the first period we've experienced, the next period, unfortunately, still to come, is a very, very uh, garden variety financial crisis. And you see it in macroeconomic markers like the run up in credit that happened before and asset prices like housing. Uh, what's uh, painfully happening afterwards. It's very hard to call the timing of a crisis, but you can certainly see these imbalances. And once it happens, there are certain clear markers, and we're just driving down the tracks, as uh, Carmen Reinhardt and I have shown uh, in, our, in, in our work over the past many years. Now, um, you know, there's certainly technology is a piece of this, and that's true in other uh, crisis when in our book, This Time is Different, which is supposed to be ironic, uh, we go through other periods of bursts of optimism, which are often associated with technology. Sometimes, I think globalization was a piece of it this time. Uh, that's not unusual, and it, you know, the thing just builds up and it blows up. That's a piece of it. But I don't think that's the core of it. I think if you took away the credit boom, it wouldn't have happened like that. And parenthetically, uh, if you're talking about things like oil prices and commodity prices, well, not the whole world experienced this. The emerging markets, they're not doing as well as they were, but they're doing a lot better than we are, and that's a big driving force of that. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Mark already addressed the issue of has risk changed, have people changed. Um, I do think to some extent uh, the government is a player here. I'll come back to that. But I also think there's some corollary of the financial crisis. Uh, if you're a big business or, say, a big Silicon Valley company with a lot of money like uh, Google, uh, you're not hurting for cash. You can invest in whatever you want. But little people cannot get money anywhere in the world. It's very, very hard as a small business to get money. A lot of the entrepreneurial ideas are from the ground up. They can't get cash. Of course, you see a more risk-averse economy in that sense. The big players are, are very uh, risk averse. Now, um, I am not, uh, there, I have colleagues who specialize in the economics of innovation. There are books on that. Uh, Peter, you may not find them that useful in your investing, I don't know. But uh, there, I have uh, Ariel Pecos, for example, as a colleague of mine, who's a great expert on this. Uh, and I won't, I'm not a scientist, I won't you know, pretend I understand. But, I mean, I think you have to be careful to distinguish between sort of the basic science and how it unfolds. For example, you can sort of joke about connectivity, but it's kind of significant. I mean, I don't know if it was like it that now my kids don't have to talk to me, they can do something else. 
but they may you know, think their welfare is higher because of that, I don't know. There are things like neuroscience where we just haven't scratched the surface of it, artificial intelligence. I like to use the example of chess where, uh, I mean, I don't have nearly the expertise of Gary and I haven't you know, really played in 30 years, but I, I can't even tell the difference between when a chess program's playing and a human's playing when I watch it. And for me, it passes the Turing test, that it's like a conversation, a primitive form of artificial intelligence, because to me, it's like a conversation, which my wife does not appreciate, but that's how I think of it. <laughs> and I think I can point to examples in nanotechnology. I walk over to MIT often, and people are just thrilled about what they're doing and uh, you know, developing new materials, uh, new ideas. Again, I won't go much into this, but I think this can unfold for a long time. Uh, it's true, they're decreasing returns. It's true. At some point, you worry about things like the environment. I mean, at, at some point, I, I ask myself, do I care how much faster we grow? I mean, you do these like calculations, if we grow at 1% a year in per capita real terms, for the, you know, indefinitely, well, we'll still double every 72 years and you know, go up by a factor of eight roughly every 200 years. Do I care if my great-great-grandchildren are eight times richer or 64 times richer? I just could care less. I care is the world stable? What kind of you know, environment do they live in? I'd be a little bit bothered if they got 8% richer and everybody else got 64% richer and that was awkward politically and militarily. I think those consequences are certainly something that's significant. But I think it's reasonable from society's point of view to sort of regroup after this period and you know, have other priorities like the environment. And lastly, I do think government policy plays an important role, certainly in research and development. Now, truth in advertising, I teach at a university. We get a lot of government money, so OK, I said it. But I do think basic science has a role to play. There's this very long-term vision where you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it and yet people find a use 50 years later, 100 years later, that's very hard for the private sector to duplicate. And this retrenchment, I see it very strongly in the United States with, say, the weaker funding over many periods of the National Science Foundation and related activities. I think that's very problematic, especially because, as Gary and Peter point out, things like the Defense Department, uh, things like Bell Labs don't exist or have pulled back tremendously from where they were, and that's very, very problematic. But there are other things, for example, monopoly policy. Monopolies are generally not great for innovation. And when you, we've changed uh, patent policies, you can hold on to a patent longer. This is not a good thing, especially in the life sciences. We're you know, not seeing, as Mark said, big innovations from big companies. And lastly, I think if you had tax policy make more sense, be simpler like a flat tax, you would get around a lot of things that I think uh, block innovation. So, you know, in, in sum, I, I do think it's important to sort of, you know, have a spirit of the future and to look, look forward. And I, I certainly want uh, my children and grandchildren to have a better life than I do, at least a little bit. I don't know if I want them to go into space, Mark. I mean, if we didn't figure out how to make that cheap, that's okay with me. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily see this as a big obstacle at the moment. I think it's the financial crisis. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank the speakers for their uh, introductory statements and give each of them an opportunity to ask each of the other side uh, one question. So two questions to each speaker. and. Uh, we can either start with Gary or Peter, whoever would like to start. Please right. keep the questions short and the responses short. All right. I'd like to have more specifics, no bromides. Oil, $20. Can we get back to the 1972 level or a clean tech? Mark, what sort of energy technology is there today that can get us back to the, even the 72 level, or are we stuck in going to really dirty coal or really dirty fracking? I don't care about the price of oil. <laughs> <laughs> I care about making it obsolete. And so what we need is policy that essentially directs research 
to make it obsolete. What I don't believe is in magic mystery science. I think there's hard work to be done. I think it may come from fusion. It may come from other research policies. And that's going to require sustained investment of the sort that only governments can provide. Um, either Peter or Gary? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm going to um, ask a question of, of Gary. When you think about the value of these inventions, I think particularly when you're looking at some of these things where you know, we're fed, we're hooked, I absolutely grant running water, uh, electricity, the steam engine, internal combustion, these were just huge. And if you're talking about you know, giving up your iPhone or giving up your car, I, well, at least for me, I mean, I think I'd rather give, give up the iPhone. And I, I think those earlier inventions that have played out was significant. But where I don't agree with what you said please, was, please pose uh, the question. Uh, was that the interaction, it's if we had more technology, uh, you know, that uh, would solve the, uh, necessarily solve the politics. I think the, uh, don't you think that the problem is more that our politics can't handle rapid technological change? Um, yeah, I think politicians just reflect public opinion. I don't think we can blame politicians for our unwillingness to take, to take risk. And when we talk about inventions, I think there's a, some sort of a 25-year cycle, you know, from inception of the idea, invention, first sample, and mass production. And everybody can think of anything we use today in mass production that was invented in the mid-80s. Um, and again, the government can probably facilitate the process. And uh, I, I disagree with this, uh, with this mm, quite a negative uh, remarks from Mark about the 50s and 60s, calling them ironically glorious years. I think it was a great time. Yes, it was probably partially of the Cold War, and obviously the Soviet Sputnik caused the Americans to create NASA. But, you know, the returns were much greater. NASA spent $750 billion over its entire existence for 55 years. Uh, just, you know, for 2010, Pentagon spent $630 billion. And look what we, everything we have today, it's thanks to these great inventions of that time because we think that space doesn't offer us any returns. But every technology we use today is connected, connect, or almost everything connected to satellites. Thank you. Um, this side has the opportunity to ask another question. Uh, okay, it's a question to, to Mark, and uh, I just follow this, this space theme. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm jealous, I have to admit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, by the way, I think it's quite ironic that in the year 2011, when Americans celebrated this uh, famous JFK speech about moon landing, America had no more rockets to fly, so they had to use Soviets. <laughs> By the way, built not by Russians, by in, in the Soviet Union. No, okay. Whether we should thank Cold War or not, I don't know. Um, and in, you know, it's uh, from, let's say from 27 to 1969, so the, uh, the, the, the very famous flight, Charles Lindbergh, from US to, to, to Europe. Uh, this is, you remember the plane, the St. Louis plane? In 1969, we had Concorde and Boeing 747. And everybody talked about supersonic flights, uh, should be reality in 90s, not even in the 21st century, in the 90s. So what's happened, Mark? Uh, why? You were lucky. You could fulfill the dream. But you're the rich man. So not everybody can afford it. And uh, uh, what happened with this dream? Why were tra traveling slower? And why there's nothing you know, in, 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 in the nearest future that can attract us and to fulfill the dreams of the 50s and 60s? There is a curious thing about wealth that it is a, um, a sneak preview of the future for everybody else. You know, a king in the 14th century could probably travel quite quickly from Oxford to London, uh, and today all of us can. Um, and so in a sense, um, wealth gives those of us who are lucky enough uh, to stumble into it um, a taste of what, what the future holds for everybody else. Ten years ago, for me, that was free phone calls. I, I went to Russia, which was an incredible experience, and... And essentially, for me, phone calls were free. It gave me the ability to go very far away and stay in touch. But today, for all of you, essentially, phone calls are free. Um, I simply think that we should not underestimate the pace of change today just because it doesn't come with 
um, dramatic changes. Just because what what Peter you know saw growing up with the Flintstones in their hover car and immortal aliens, you know chasing around the stars, just because that isn't our reality today doesn't mean that we don't have an extraordinary pace of change, and certainly doesn't mean that the pace of technology change has anything to do with the financial challenges that we face economically, globally today. Okay. Thank you. Um, this side has the chance. Mark? You pass? You pass from for both of them? Any more questions from this side? Sure, I'll ask one more question. I, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really stuck by, struck by the complacency that, uh, that everything is continuing as before and nothing is different. And you know, I think the, these crises were created by expectations of progress. The credit was lent because people thought the future would be better and a better future could pay off the debts of the past. Um, you know, uh, either one of you can answer this question, but it's, uh, it's really, uh, why have wages not gone up in 40 years when they w went up 350% in the 40 years before then. Isn't, isn't that evidence that there has been a real change, a real deceleration of sorts? Well, uh, it's interesting you say that because the leading explanation of why inequalities exploded is technologies moved at a much faster pace uh, in recent years mm -hmm. and interacting with globalization and people have not been able to shift skills fast enough. And so more educated people, this is the explanation uh, my colleagues Larry Katz and Claudia Golden give and uh, many others, for example, that it's actually the rapid technology and are, are, uh, are trying to confront that. Um. Okay, thank you very much. We, uh, if then I'm, you got. At what point, you know, after printing, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars uh, and, you know, following these too big to fail policies, at what point we can say that it's really different? The time is really different. Okay. Um. I'm sure all of you have done that experiment where you grow a crystal. Uh, and you learn that if you grow a crystal too quickly, it's very weak, it's not strong, it's not robust. I would say that a lot of the investment, a lot of the spending that you're describing um, was trying to grow a crystal too quickly. It's trying to live up to false promises. It was creating growth which was fake. Our problem today is not today's growth, and it's not the prospect of anemic growth in the future. It's that some of the past growth that we measured was fake. It was flawed. And worse, it was funded by debt. So there lie the roots of the financial crisis today, that progress takes time. You asked how wages have not grown in 40 years. I would ask, in which part of the world are you measuring? Perhaps in the US. We haven't seen wage growth. But I come from Africa, and I see extraordinary growth and extraordinary optimism. Those of us here from Asia and China would say the last 40 years have seen extraordinary growth. And so when we just step back and ask the question, what does it take to create sustainable growth? One of the things it takes is time. OK, uh, if there are no more questions from this side, I think we've uh, exhausted the questions.